All right. Any more handouts needed somewhere? Everybody has handouts? Cool. Oh, one more over there. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to EE141, uh, which is, as uh, you may know, uh, Introduction to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm uh, quite happy to be here. I've, I haven't been teaching this class in a couple of years, so it actually is quite exciting for me to do it again. It's going to be a lot of fun. I am, I'm sure about that. So you know, I'm going to try to make it exciting. And I'll, I'm sure, actually, that the, at the end of the semester, you, you will have learned a lot. So uh, I'm going to try to guarantee you that. So uh, what we're going to do today is just kind of walk a little bit over the class, what we're going to do, what the logistics are, and so on and so forth. There's some more. Let's see, is there any, any seats left? There's one more seat left over there. There's one more seat left over there. So, so that's what I'm going to plan to do today, is kind of just walk a little bit to the logistics and then give you some generic feeling of why this class could be important. Uh, why is this, what are you going to learn, and what the challenges are in digital ICs these days. Um, if I kind of um, doze off a little bit in the middle of the lecture, don't be surprised. I just got off three hours ago, I got off the plane from uh, Seoul, so got right from the airport, got a shower, and right in here. So I think I hope I'll, I'll make it through the lecture without any problem, but that shouldn't be a uh, issue. Anyhow, um, a couple of things. I handed out the uh, passed out the hand. I'm also going to pass around another thing. This is uh, the class list, enrollment class list, as it was of uh, a week ago. So that I want to make sure that you go to this on the left side, mark of your name if you're here. And um, a couple of other things you have to mark off. In terms of lab sessions, um, there's three lab sessions. Uh, just mark off the one you would prefer to take. I know you've all filled these things in on the, on the website and things like that, but, but that's not absolutely essential. Uh, it's important that you pick one and that you stick to it. I'll come back to that later. So fill the one in that you would like to take. I know that some of those lab sessions right now are over-enrolled. That shouldn't be a problem. We're going to adjust up, up the levels a little bit on each of those lab sessions and we should be fine. I also want to make sure, uh, and uh, I have two other questions I would like you to answer. One of them, if, if you have taken E105. That's one thing that I would like to know. And the second one, if you have taken CS150 before you took this lecture, or if you do it concurrently or something like that. So just mark off. Also, if there's any errors, I don't think there should be any errors, but you never know. Um, computers occasionally can go wrong. Um, so mark off, uh, make sure that uh, check if the data, especially your email address and things like that is correct. OK? So let me hand start over there, and then you can kind of roll it around. But make sure that before the end of the lecture that you have this uh, form kind of filled in. All right. Microphone. All ready. Good. So, the introduction to digital integrated circuits. Uh, by the way, my name is Jan Rabai, uh, if you haven't guessed that yet. So uh, I'll introduce some other people who are going to be important in a couple of minutes. But let me first uh, talk a little bit about what this class is all about. So um, if you've taken E40, you've probably taken 105, uh, maybe 130, maybe 140. You have learned a little bit about, digital, uh, about integrated circuits, the idea of uh, integrating a set of transistors onto a piece of silicon and make it do something reasonable. Well, this class is on one particular set of uh, circuits, which we call digital circuits. Things that presumably execute Boolean logic, zeros and ones. Now, uh, you might have heard, uh, probably in 40, you heard about inverters. You learned a little bit how a digital inverter might look like, uh, how you can put transistors together. And that's a good start. But in this class, we're going to go a lot further. I think by, uh, uh, obviously, we're going to start from the basics. But then step by step, we're going to do more complex things. And I'm pretty sure that when you walk out of here um, in about uh, four months or so, that you should be able to design a fairly complex digital circuit, uh, including logic, 
basically pure Boolean operations, but also memory, finite state machines, and potentially even put them together into a small processor. Okay, so we're going to go to all those basic and learn you how to do this type of things. Now, it's one thing to design those things and make them work presumably correctly, but there's some other things you have to take in mind when you design one of those circuits. It's not sufficient to say, here's a processor and it works. Now, typically, you want to optimize it for certain functionality. Right? Um, you want to make, first of all, you want to make sure that it always works. Like when suddenly it's cold or it's warm, you want to make sure it always works under different temperature conditions. So you want to make it reliable. Right? That's important. Because something is a circuit that occasionally makes errors and not a very good circuit. The second thing is uh, very often it has to meet some performance specification. Right? Uh, a process that runs at 100 hertz could be interesting for some applications, but most of the time it's not very interesting. So targeting a circuit for a certain speed is absolutely essential. If you're in the microprocessor business, the faster, very often, the better. Right? Uh, you can sell a process that runs at 3 gigahertz, can sell for more money than something that runs at 2 gigahertz. So it's a financial benefit. And, and for a long time, that's the only thing that people cared. How fast can you go? Right? Um, anytime, any new generation of Intel processors was a little bit faster than the previous one. And that's what you sell. And everybody was enticed to buy a new laptop because it was faster. These days, it's a little bit different. Uh, you see the performance, uh, actually clock frequencies are not going up that fast anymore. And there's a couple of good reasons. I'll explain in this class why we suddenly don't see 10 gigahertz microprocessors. And one of the good reasons for that is power. Uh, power is a very important argument. Definitely, if you want to have a portable device, you want to make sure it lasts for a little bit. So another metric we're going to look at is power dissipation. And obviously, there's another one, which is cost. Um, I can make chips that are small, or I can make chips that are bigger. Now, the cost of a chip basically is a very strong function of the size. Uh, some components I can sell for $1,000. That's really nice. If I can basically charge for a single chip, $1,000, that's cool. I can have a nice markup. Other ones, basically things that go in cell phones, or things that go in little appliances, or your consumer devices, or your iPods, typically have to go for $3 like a Wi-Fi chipset or something like that, $5, $10 is what you shoot at. So cost is another very important argument. So there's a bunch of things you have to optimize when you're designed. There's a bunch of different dimensions you can optimize it over. And that's really what circuit design is all about. You have a certain function you want to implement, and then you have a set of constraints. And within that constraints pane, you have all those parameters you can play around with. And that's the art of design. Design is, here's the specs, and then be innovative, creative, and um, obviously also uh, analytical in the way to come is to a certain solution. So that's really what this class is. We're going to start from small, simple things. We're going to start looking actually at the basic building blocks. Um, obviously, I've heard about transistors before. Um, I'll revisit some of that, because something you learn in 130 might be very interesting. It might not be very worthwhile for something when you start doing digital circuit design. Right? Um, it's nice to know of how, how this whole, what barrier uh, band gaps are and how those uh, basically different charges, electrons, cross, that's neat stuff. But it's not something that as a circuit designer I really care about. I care about is what does that device really do for me? What are the characteristics of the device? And can I abstract them away in such a way that I can use that information to build things that don't have one transistor, not ten transistors, but maybe 100 million transistors. So building very complex things <coughs> requires a concept which you call abstraction. I will talk more about that as well. So that's really what this class is all about. It's uh, starting from the basics and then slowly but surely putting them together and ultimately at the end of the semester being able to do fairly complex things. So as I said, what we want to do is looking at performance, power dissipation, cost, and reliability. These are the four metrics that every designer always thinks about. Okay. Um, so uh, this kind of a, a, a short outline of the, of the class. Um, as I mentioned, we, I think it's absolutely essential that we revisit transistors a little bit. Um, at least what I would like to do is saying, 
here's what you learn in 105. Here's what you learn in 130. Let's now abstract that away. I don't want you to think about all those physical effects. Can I come up with a simple model that you can then use to put things together? I, that's the whole idea. And um, at the same time, I want to point out that transistors are, that we're using today are a little bit different than the transistors we used about 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, life was beautiful at that point in time. When you basically were talking about transistors which were one micron in channel length, the overall operation was quite simple. But the, when we make them smaller and smaller and smaller, and today, most companies today use 65 nanometer technology, and the minimum line, line length is 65 nanometers. Intel has just its first parts out in 45 nanometers. Uh, those transistors are a little bit icky. Uh, they have a lot of little things happening to them that don't make them as beautiful anymore. And I want to point out some of those things because uh, ultimately, um, at the end of this semester, most of you are probably senior. A lot of you might actually look at uh, job interviews when you get out of here. And you will see when you go to the different companies, this might, people might ask you questions along that line. So I think it's good to be prepared to see a little bit about what's going on in industry today. And I hope Albus can help you a little bit with that as well. So we start with transistors. Then we're going to start building them up into basic components. Actually, we're going to first look in quite a lot of detail at an inverter. Now, the inverter is ultimately boring, right? It doesn't do anything. It takes a zero in, gets a one out, gets a one in, gets a zero out. Not very exciting. But I have one claim. My claim is that if you understand how to design an inverter well, you probably can do any digital logic circuit. Uh, it's basically the same thing. It's just more complex. But it's the same type of analysis methodology, the same type of elements that come back. So it's very important for us to understand inverters well. Once you do so, I think life becomes a lot easier. And you can do very complex things. I can build adders, multipliers, dividers, you name it, ALUs, uh, very much based on the same concept. So that's why it's worthwhile for us to spend some time on thinking through what an inverter does and what it's all about. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start with inverters, and then we're going to start building more complex things. Uh, logic, very complex logic. I think uh, we're going to talk a lot about adders. You might ask why adders are important. Well, you see that every microprocessor, one of the most important elements of a microprocessor is the adder. If you want to make something fast, you better have a fast adder. We're also going to talk a little bit about multipliers and other arithmetic blocks. Now, these are pure what we call combinational functional logic blocks. Combinational functional logic blocks means blocks that you apply an input and you see an output. And the output is a direct function of the input you apply at that point in time. No memory in a combination logic block. Now, it's very hard to build anything useful if you don't have memory. So most of the real circuits we're going to talk around, also you need somewhere registers or you need memory blocks to remember what has happened in the past. So talking about sequential circuits, that's what they call circuits that combine combination logic with memory registers. That's a sequential logic block. OK? So uh, let's see. And then there's some other things we have to talk about. Um, managing what's happening in a chip takes some effort. Right? You have all those things happening. If you think about a complex processor, there's lots of things happening at the same time. If you're not careful, they basically all fight each other. They crash each other, and so on and so forth. So you have to create some order. You have to make sure that things happen at the right time. If things happen too early, you might get the wrong result. So most of the circuits we're using today, virtually all digital circuits we're using today, are using what's called a synchronous approach. Somewhere we have clock elements. That's what you buy, right? You say when you buy a 3 gigahertz microprocessor, there's somewhere an element which is a 3 gigahertz clock. That clock is kind of the policeman that basically orders all the events in the processor. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about clocks, because they're a very important element in the design of a circuit. Okay? And then finally, we'll talk about wires. <coughs> Seems boring, but wires are important. And I'm, at the end, towards the end of the semester, I'm going to talk a little bit about how people do things in industry. 
uh, design methodologies. How do you design uh, a chip which has 100 million transistors? Do you do every transistor one by one? Obviously not. That would take a lot, a lot of people. So we have tools to help us. They basically allow you to repeat blocks, make bigger blocks, and so on and so forth. So talk a little bit about design methodology is going to be important as well. So that's kind of the outline of this, this talk, uh, this course. As, as you can see, we go from the simple, but we end up with the fairly complex. All right, uh, having said that, let's talk a little bit about practical things. And by the way, um, at any point in time, feel free to interrupt me. Ask questions. This is very informal, very interactive. I like it when their questions are being asked, so don't be shy. OK? Good. Are there still microphones around here? Do you still have microphones on your desk? Uh, that's one yes. thing I want to point out. There's a big sign in the back there that says, please use microphones. Now, it sounds like crazy, right? Why should I use a microphone in a space like this? Hello? Well, as you know, this, uh, this and I'll explain a bit in a second, this class is videotaped, is webcasted, is podcasted, whatever you name it, right? Uh, we, we try to do all those features. Now, it's very important, obviously, uh, video is nice, but video without any sound is kind of hard to understand. And definitely, it's kind of annoying when somebody asks a question and you hear the answer, but you never figure out what the question was. So that's why you need to use those microphones. When you ask a question, just put, take the microphone, push on the button, and ask a question. And this way, you're going to be eternalized. You're going to be on tape. Uh, it's a first step to, uh, to start on. So good. All right, so having said that, uh, so my name is Jan Rabai. My office hours are uh, going to be um, just after lectures on Wednesdays. So right after lecture, I'm going to have office hours 3.30 to 5.00. And they be held in uh, a room which is called 545E Corey Hall. Now, it's the fifth floor of Corey Hall. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, it's, um, you have to pass through some barrier. Uh, you take the elevator to the fifth floor, and you move to the other corner, uh, 545, which is called the DOP Center. Now, the DOP center typically is locked off with one of those card key type of entry points. My office is just behind that. But what I'm making sure is when we have office hours, um, I basically will open, that door will be unlocked so you can just walk in. Okay? Um, if that would not be the case, you can just call, my, there's outside there's a little note, you can just call a phone number and I'll let you in. But typically it will be unlocked. OK, we have three excellent TAs in this uh, class. I think um, I must say each of those um, I know very well. They're all graduate students of mine. They all have a lot of design experience. And since there's going to be a lot in design in this class, I think each of them is going to be an excellent help in projects and things like that. So I think that's um, it's going to be a real asset. Um, let me introduce them a little bit. Well, actually, I can use the next picture. Actually, I use this. Um, this is a picture uh, from one of our ski trips couple of years ago, where uh, most of the TAs, myself, on the, myself is in there. Simone is the person on the left of the picture, you see right there, Simone Gambini. And then you have uh, Luis Alarson, Luis right there. And Mike was not on a ski trip, but I had to kind of paste him in there using Photoshop. Uh, so this is uh, Michael Mark. <laughs> so they also will have office hours, they will help you with labs, discussion sessions, and things like that. Okay. Um, I tend to be um, an electronic person. I like computers and things like that. I hate paper. So I'm going to run this class almost completely to the website. So anything in terms of information, and anything in terms of lab stuff, and anything with class notes, everything is posted on the website. And you find the address right here. But you also can go to the department website. You go to the department website, go to E141, you end up in the same space. Um, please use this as effectively as possible. Uh, I, as I, said, I hate to basically print out tons of stuff. So uh, make sure you look at a very regular base onto the website and see what's going on there. OK, you've seen that. OK, a couple of things about discussion session and labs. Um, in the um, in the uh, class schedule, we had scheduled for three discussion sessions, but in my opinion, two discussion sessions are are just fine. 
So I picked the one on Wednesday and Thursday, okay? Uh, the one on Wednesday afternoon, late 5, uh, 6 p.m. is, uh, is going to be presented by Simone, and the one on Thursday is presented by Mike, okay? Now, don't worry about sign up for those discussion sessions. You can choose any one of the two to go to. It's a very flexible thing. It, we won't take attention, uh, basically, we don't do any uh, uh, roll calls or anything like that. Just show up. If you really like them, you can go to both of them, even though they will present the same information, typically. But there might be different people, different corners, so you really get excited about the class and its material. Hey, uh, <laughs> go to all of them, and it um, doesn't matter. Okay? The lab is a little bit different thing, because we have three lab sessions. There will be lab reports and so on and so forth, so it's important that you pick one lab. I don't care which one it is, as long as we don't overall and over enroll them. That's why I basically have this handout sheet going around. I want to get a tally on how many people want to go on Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Okay? Uh, because uh, we're basically constrained in terms of workstations, in terms of equipment. Uh, each lab session can only have a limited number. Also, your lab report will go to the TA who's basically managing that lab. So if you start going to different labs, you might get lost, and you won't get graded for them. Okay? So just pick one and stick to it. Yes? Excuse me, uh, what happens to the Tuesday lab? Um, were there four labs? Um, let me know if there's a need. So here's the math that I knew. Um, Pre-enrollment for the class was about 65. Uh, there's 24 students that can fit in the lab. 24 times 3 was 72. So, well, that fits perfectly well. Um, I hate to basically have labs that are enrolled. If, however, it turns out that we need to offer it, no problem. If it turns out that some people cannot make any of these other labs, let me know. So if you, if you write it down, or if you have the handout sheet, make sure that you kind of, uh, and we'll see if there's a need to run it. But uh, I rather would not if I can avoid it. I, I think um, it's better to have, uh, um, I think, a sizable entity. I don't want to waste time, bottom line. Yes? Um, did you say one of the discussions was canceled? Because I think um, I was enrolled for the Thursday 5 to 6 or 4 to 5 or something, and that's the only one that works for me. Everything else uh, okay. overlaps. Okay, so there was a Thursday 4 to 5. I have to check into this and see, now, again, if there's nothing works, let me know. Send me an email also. Um, and that, then that basically can help me to schedule a little bit things uh, around. So. But again, as I said, I, I, I try to make sure that we use our uh, TA time effectively and get the maximum value for all of you. Okay? So we'll, that's why um, we have fortunately have some time to think around this. Uh, as I will mention in a second, there's no lab next week. The first lap will start in week number three. <coughs> okay? So don't worry too much directly. There's nothing happening this week. No lap next week either. Are you doing this week? No. First discussion is next week. We're starting on, mon uh, on next Wednesday will be the first discussion session. So this is the way I kind of had planned it out. Uh, trying to, to look a little bit at the overall schedule of the semester. So the three laps are here. We have the lectures, you know when those are. My office hours are on Wednesdays, right here. Simone has his office hours at uh, 3.30 to 5 on Friday. Mike has them on Thursday morning, just after his discussion session. Louis, uh, he just got back, so we still haven't, we have to finalize his uh, exact time uh, for the office hours, uh, for his office hours. Now, you will see that the class, all the office hours and things like that are loaded towards the end of the week. And there's a good, darn good reason for that. You see this line here? Friday, 5 p.m. is when the homeworks are due, the assignments are due. And I know from experience that the day after you give out an assignment, you will get actually the new assignments on Friday. Nobody looks at them for about two or three days. And then towards the end, like one or two days before you have to turn them in, everybody starts working on them. And that's when office hours become quite handy. So that's why we backloaded the office hours to be located 
around or just before when the homework is due. Okay, it's a lot more effective. When nothing is more boring than office hours, nobody shows up because they haven't looked at the problems yet. Okay, um, so what the discussion session, by the way, what we could do in the discussion session is kind of take some topics that were discover, uh, discussed in the lecture, but that might be a little bit more complex. So we pick a couple of problems or issues that I know are harder, and the TAs go in more detail through them. They basically show some examples. Uh, tackle some of those things that I know from experience cause people to say, hey, what's going on here, and so on and so forth. Okay? Alrighty. So what else do we have? Uh, about 10 homeworks, um, approximately. For instance, when we have midterms, there's no homework. When projects are due, there's no homework. That's why we end up with about approximately 10 assignments. Now, let me tell you something about assignments. Um, I don't care how you make them. Um, um, I don't care if you copy them from your partner, whatever you do, that's your issue. However, I can tell you one thing, the exams or the midterms and the finals typically are very much based on similar type of ideas when you have homework. If you want to do well in the homework and in the midterms and the finals, I would definitely recommend that you go in it to the uh, assignments in a very detailed fashion because that's the only place where you learn the skills of basically addressing the questions we're going to do in the finals, midterms, and so on and so forth. And by the way, midterms and finals, they're fully open book. Um, they're very problem oriented, so you can bring anything you want to, uh, except cell phones, uh, communication devices, or boyfriends or whatever it is uh, to help you out. Uh, but otherwise, you can bring anything. So they're, um, they're very much focused on understanding. We give you some problems and let you address them. But it's based on understanding rather than busy work and so on and so forth, or trying to turn, learn things by heart, by head, and things like that. I don't think it's uh, very effective. That's why I think doing the assignments on your own is important. Obviously, you can talk your, to your colleagues and things like that. That's no problem at all. But I definitely would recommend it that you do that, because I've seen the correlation between People who do their homeworks well and how you do in the midterms and finals is they're very much correlated with each other. Okay, so um, we have, as I said, we have labs. Now most of the labs are going to be software labs. What I mean by a software lab is that we're going to learn you how to use tools. As I already mentioned, yes, question. Uh huh. Okay. So somewhere I must have. Uh, it's definitely the midterm. I know for sure that the midterm is on a Friday. I know that for sure. So I have to check. I, I might have just mistyped it. Uh, anybody has a calendar next? Thank you. That's good. This, cell phones are good for some some good things. I think it's probably. I probably mean the 29th. Probably mean the 29th. Uh, pretty sure about that. But I'll correct it for sure. But it's clearly on a Friday. I know that. The other one is on a, mid, uh, on a, on, on a Wednesday. What do we do with midterms is there's no uh, class that day. We don't have lecture. And uh, since we need a much bigger classroom, that's why I move it to the evenings. Then we can get a much bigger room. During the day, it's impossible on campus here to find a large room. So we typically do between 6 or 7.30, 6.30 to 8, something like that. Now, the final is on uh, May 16. Make sure you notice this, note it down. Uh, co don't come back to me later. Well, I have overlapping finals or anything like that. And those dates are well known, so be aware of that. They're also on a Friday, 5 to 8 p.m. It's a wonderful week to, uh, way to end a week. Uh, <laughs> last thing of the week, final of 141. Anyhow. Good, so uh, I was talking about uh, the labs. So the software labs are really learning how to use the tools. Uh, simulation tools, but also layout tools. Uh, the main reason we do this is because we have another thing, which is a project. And the project is very much orienting to do actual practical design. Learning how to build a complex circuit, optimize it, and make some interesting specifications. And in order to do so, you're going to have to be proficient with the tools. Obviously, um, let me just ask them who of you has used SPICE before? 
virtually everyone, right? So 105 uses Spice. Um, does 40 use Spice these days? No? Not yet. Well, it should. Um, so Spice is a big tool. But then we also have layout tools, tools that allow you to take a design and turn it into a piece of art, an artwork that basically consists of polygons. We'll talk that you ultimately can go to a fabric and they're going to make a circuit of that. Uh, but it's not sufficient to know the layout tools. We also have to be able to take that layout and turn it, check if it's correct. There's a set of rules you have to follow. Do some extraction on it. Basically, is what, what's happening when I do a layout? What are the parasitics that are emerging from it? And so on and so forth. So in this class, we're using a set of commercial tools that a lot of companies use it's, uh, from a company called Cadence. Cadence is one of the larger uh, tool uh, companies that makes CAD tools or tools for the design of circuits. So that's what we're going to use in this class. So you're going to get some experience with real industrial tools for the design of circuits. And that's really what those labs do. They get you experience with those tools. And then when you go into project, you should be able to use them to do your particular project. Uh, there's going to be also one hardware lab. Um, I think it's always interesting to, um, you might do a lot of simulation. You might know all the waveforms that come out of like Spice. But nothing beats seeing a real waveform on an uh, oscilloscope. Uh, take an inverter, put something in, and see what comes out. And you might be surprised very often that there's other things coming out of there that you didn't expect. So hardware, even, um, it's only when you really start testing a chip that you might see what all the type of things that might happen around it or that, basically. So I think one time actually doing some uh, playing around with the hardware, measure some things on real actual devices is a good thing to do. OK? Um, then let me talk a little bit about the project. Um, as I mentioned, this class is a design class. My goal is not to learn you how to basically give you a little circuit, and you do a lot of equations, and in the end, you come up with the answer. It's 42 or something like that. As you will learn in, in, in uh, real life, uh, the answer is never going to be 42. It's, it might be, it varies. Right? Um, you will learn that uh, when you do circuit design, there's always a level of uncertainty that goes with it. The models you're basically working with are not entirely correct. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things at play when you start doing circuit design uh, that you have to start being aware of. And the only way to really experience those things is to actually start playing with an actual problem. So, well, here's the task at hand. Design me this. And this will be the specs. And try to do the best possible job. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. And there's going to be no precise answer. There might be a lot of good answers. That's the nature of design. But pick the one you think is the best one for that particular set of targets. And that's really what we're going to do in the project. Is, uh, uh, we're going to do this, obviously, in a phase fashion. I'm not going to ask you to design a 100 million transistor microprocessor. Um, we'll, uh, definitely, for the 15 weeks we have, that would pushing a little bit. Uh, now, we're going to do something a little bit smaller, but still it's going to be fun. In the sense that all, it's going to be challenging. Uh, when we put out the designs out there, it's not something that's going to be trivial. It's going to require you to think and maybe modify things and maybe come up with some new solutions that might not be trivial. So this semester, I'm thinking about the project to do something which is in the arithmetic space. don't know exactly yet what it is, but it's going to be something that computes certain arithmetic functions. And we're going to optimize them for either power, performance, size, set of factors. And it will require that you're going to do some layout. But at the same time, I'm going to try to minimize the busy work. What I really after is the thinking process that goes into coming up with the best possible design. OK? <coughs> so I think that's where you're going to learn the most. Um, obviously, the lectures are helpful. They're going to give you the basics. The homeworks will help you to get the basic skills. It's only in the project that you start applying them in kind of a coordinated fashion. Okay? So I think these are the kind of the, the, the crown piece of this whole class is, is a design project. All right. And that's also reflected to a certain extent into the grading policy for the class. Um, as I said, homeworks uh, are, um, import, are important as a learning tool. 
but the overall percentage is about 10% of the grade. Um, so, but it's still 10%. There's some people who don't even bother turning them in. Well, you give 10% away, <laughs> bottom line, right? You don't want to do that. So um, think about it. Labs, 10% as well. The project is 20% of the grade. So that's an important part, part of it. So it's a, a, has a fairly big impact. Midterms, there's two midterms, so each of them on 15%, and the final is on 30%. Okay? Alrighty. A uh, couple of little things before we start talking about the fun stuff. This is all kind of boring uh, administrative stuff. Um, I have set up a uh, alias uh, where you can send email to the whole class. It's, um, I believe, ee. 141-class, it's on the website, at Corey. Uh, if you really have something that you want to make sure that everybody in the class is aware of instantaneously, you can use that alias. Um, but as you know, you all know that spam is a big problem these days. Most of the time we're sitting there deleting email messages. So try to avoid sending too much information to that email alias. Okay, it's only when it's, you feel it's really urgent, like this homework assignment does not make any sense, things like that. Sometimes it might be worthwhile to, to broadcast quickly. Um, but otherwise, just use a news group. Uh, we have a news group. Uh, the TAs will be monitoring the news group. They will be posting stuff there on a regular basis, so use that. Okay. Um, I already mentioned that you can work together on your homework. I don't really care, but you have to get in your own solution. And don't just copy it. You have to kind of write it on your own. Right? It's important. No late assignments because um, not like, hey, I missed the deadline by two days. Typically what I do is I post the solutions almost a couple of hours after the deadline of the homework. So uh, at that point in time, a late, late turning of your homework doesn't make much sense. Um, there's one thing that I'm reminded by the, by the staff of the department. This is we, we have one room, which is 353, where we do all the software lab, where we have the hardware labs, where you can do your project stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of computers there with all the tools on that you can use. Uh, they don't like it when you start basically turning this into a pizza uh, parlor or something like that. Uh, definitely, and, and I know how it happens, right? Suddenly, project time is due. You have to turn in your project at midnight that day or something like that. Everybody sleeps and lives there. But uh, we're trying to keep this place a nice place for everybody to work in. Lab reports are due one week after lab session, and you turn them into the TA of that session. Oh, projects and labs are done in pairs. So every project you have to find somewhere. Think about that already. Your project is going to have to do with two people together. So try to find somebody who you can comfortable working with. And then there's obviously something you have to say when you have exams. It's open book, but that mean, doesn't mean that you basically can copy from your neighbor. So uh, that's not something we uh, uh, would appreciate very much. All right, almost there. Website, I said the website has everything on there that we need. Uh, textbook is the second edition of the uh, Digital Integrated Circuits, the, the book that I wrote together with Ananta Chandrakasan. And from MIT and Bora Nikolic here from Berkeley. Uh, we might add some extra notes on the class occasionally when I feel like I do some material which is maybe new or different. We'll post some uh, extra notes on the class. Also, the lecture notes, the, the slides I'm using, will always be available before the class. So I'm, I'm going to make, I, and I'm very consistent in this, I'm, I'll make sure that all the lecture notes are available one hour before the lecture on the website. So you can copy them onto your computer or whatever it is. Now I know that lots of you would like to make like to scribble things on the notes. That's why I print out a number of them in advance. But um, in general, um, I don't print out as many as the whole class because I know some people don't pick them up, and I don't want to waste trees. So I'm just going to bring in a, a small set uh, before the lecture, and you can pick them up. There's also going to be available in a room, which is, I think, 253 Cori. If you go before the lecture, 253 Cori, the class notes, print some of the copied class notes will be available there as well. OK? And that's also where you have to bring in homeworks, uh, where you drop them off, and so on and so forth. It's all in the same place. There's a couple of 
which are uh, mentioned as to be um, 141. And that's basically it. Again, the website, look at it fairly often. And as I said, don't keep on printing stuff. Um, it's electronic form, just works as well. Save it on your laptop. Uh, it's just as good. I don't have piles of paper around. I'm not going to come in with big piles every lecture. That's not my intention. Yes? Can we use your laptops on the uh, midterms and finals and whatnot? Absolutely. You can use them, um, even though I might not recommend it because obviously it isn't quite intense. And if you can sit in there and using Google uh, uh, Desktop to say, well, gee, I know, I've seen it somewhere in the do a search to my laptop, see if the solution is there. Uh, you can try, but you're going to lose a lot of time doing so. But I don't care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, as long as you don't, as you don't start doing basically uh, chatting and, and uh, so um, I have to think about that one a little bit because obviously um, we can start building a nice network <laughs> of components. So I'll, I have to think. I've, I've never seen it done. Um, in principle, there's nothing against, it, but the networking aspects definitely add some interesting type of uh, edges to it that I hadn't thought about. Okay, so as I said, the course is webcasted, uh, which is useful. If you cannot make the lecture, uh, you, you can watch it from your dorm room or wherever you are. Or you can watch it later on because it's archived as well. And you can watch it as many times as you want to. If you really like a lecture, you can watch it four times in a row. Um, and, and you will be surprised. People sometimes do this. Okay, I mentioned cadence, and very important. And we have some tutorials online. Actually, the first labs basically will do nothing else than walking you to the basics. There's nothing very complex in there, but it will help you set up the stuff and work to the basics. And for simulation, we use a tool. We don't we use call, use a tool called HSpice. Uh, Spice is a simulator, circuit simulator. As I said, most of you have played around with it. Um, it's a tool that's uh, very popular, but there's also a whole bunch of versions of it. Different companies have different versions of Spice. There's a P Spice, and there's an A Spice, and so on and so forth. HSpice, I, I believe, is one of the best versions around there. That, that is very effective. So that's the one we're going to use in this class. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. I think uh, due to uh, basically some uh, external constraints, we're using Spectre actually. Are we using Spectre? Yeah. Even better. Well, it's pretty similar. Um, we have we have HPICE in there too, right? Uh, we have, but uh, the, the new design kit doesn't have models for SPICE. It only has models for Spectre. Okay. So let me put this next one. And we have the we have the uh, Spectre. <coughs> is a very spice-like device. It's based on the same concept. It's uh, also a tool that basically is solved by Cadence. And that's, uh, since we're using the Cadence tools, um, Spectre kind of interacts a lot more better with the, uh, with the designs, the design entries you do within Cadence and things like that. So that's the main reason for this. By the way, we're going to use, a, as far as I know, a 90 nanometer technology for this class. So we're going to upgrade a little bit from what people did in the past. I think in the past we were using 130 nanometers or 180 nanometer technology. I think it's worthwhile to go forward with time. 90 nanometers is, uh, is a decent technology. Um, still a lot of companies, as I said, the state of the art is 65 nanometers. But nine, I would say 70% of designs in the industry today are still done in 90 nanometers. So this is really state of the art. It's not something which is totally outdated. And, then, and as uh, Simone was saying, the models we have are 90 nanometer spectrum models. And that's what we're going to use spectre as the simulation tool. Thank you for uh, made, updating me on that. OK. Um, I want to uh, hit the ground running. Um, as, is, as I mentioned, SPICE is going to be an important tool. And since the first weeks are kind of not much happening anyhow yet, I think it's a good time for you to get things back in shape. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to give you today a first assignment, which is due by next Friday. So not this Friday, but Friday next week. And it's just making sure you have your computer account, that you still remember your password, and that you can run a simple spy simulation on a very simple example. So it's really getting spice to work, 
getting the, the tools set up, the environment set up, and learn how to print out the results and turn them in. Okay? It's pure, what I say, a logistical style homework. But I think it's a useful one because then from the next homework on, I'm going to assume that you know how to run Spice or Spectre and go forward with that. So this is due February 1. This week, as I said, there's nothing else happening. No discussion sessions, no laps this week. First discussion sessions will start next week. So there's one, the first one is going to be next Wednesday. Okay? No laps in week two. First laps in week three. That's going to have the first software lap. Okay? And that's basically all I wanted to say about logistics. Okay? Any questions? Any other things that are unclear? So, um, one, one well, extra question. Who of you has not, I know there's uh, some limits that we are starting to hit some enrollment limits. <coughs> Who has not been capable of enrolling in the class? One, two, three, four. <coughs> okay. I'll make sure that we're going to up some of those barriers quickly, and I would like to basically resolve all the enrollment issues by the end of the week. So, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure. Make sure that you write up under a sign-up that you said, hey, I'm still working on my enrollment. But I can probably see on the computer as well. Okay. All right. That was the... Let's now talk a little bit about, about the exciting things. It's, um, why would you take a class on digital integrated circuits? Um, and, and there's another one. Is, is, that's one question. Is, is What's the exciting part about it? And the second thing is, what's happening? Where is digital IC design going in the future? Why is it different than in the past. What are the, what's going to happen five, ten years from now? I think it's worthwhile to think a little bit about that because one of the exciting parts about integrated circuits is that it's creation in motion. Over the last 40, 50 years, we've seen an amazing set of things happening, right? Um, in 19, the first transistor, late 1940s, first integrated circuit, which means a transistor on a piece of silicon, late 50s. That's so we're about 58 years later, about six decades approximately. We've gone from one transistor to now the capability of a billion transistors on a chip. And we're not done yet. Uh, every year, every couple of years, new technology comes in, more transistors, faster transistors, lower power, all those kind of things. And that's really what has driven this massive industry, which is the semiconductor industry. Uh, industry of about, uh, I think if you add it all together, probably about a $100 billion type of industry. It's not bad. Uh, and it has been growing on a very consistent base. Sometimes there's little ups and downs, but overall we have been growing. So the question you might ask yourself, is this going to continue for the next 50 years? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, are there challenges? Yes, there are challenges, and I will point some of those out. But at the same time, the same concepts that I basically will show in this class have been valid for a long time and will remain valid for some time to come. So let me a little bit give you a history of digital integrated or digital circuits. Um, the idea of doing things in a digital fashion rather than analog fashion has been around for quite some time. Right? Um, uh, people. Um, so um, the idea that you actually can represent data not as a voltage or a current or a temperature or whatever it is, but as a set of uh, digits, 0, 1, or decimal numbers was around for quite some time. But actually it was only in the early 1800s that some people really started thinking about, hey, I maybe should be able to build something that's, instead of having an abacus, uh, build something which is a real computing engine. And there was one uh, very innovative person um, called Babbage, who lived in London in the early 1800s. Um, and that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution at the time. He had this idea of a purely mechanical based computer, based on cranks and gears and shafts. Um, pretty amazing machine. He designed the whole thing, uh, had it all uh, on blueprint. Um, never managed to build it completely because it was too expensive. Um, the cost 
of uh, the whole thing was about 17,000 pounds in 1800. Now, if you, if you would look at this today, that would be a huge amount of money. So he never managed to build it. Uh, he only did parts here and there. But then about 30 years ago, 20 years ago, some people over and since they had the blueprints, people said, hey, let's build it for sure. And now we have better tools to do those gears and things. So they built actually a big chunk of it. And lo and behold, the thing worked completely. It was perfectly functional. Um, so he had the whole vision, had everything in place to build a computer, but didn't manage to ultimately make it happen. Now, there's some very interesting things about this computer. First of all, this is not a computer like today. Well, most of our computers work on Boolean information, zeros and ones. This was a decimal computer. It has every, if you look at it very carefully, you see that every gear has basically 10, 10 gear teeth, so going from 0, 1 to 9. Uh, the other thing that's very amazing about this machine is it had a lot of concepts in there that later made it into microprocessors, like I was doing pipelining already. Uh, those of you who have taken CS150 might have heard about pipelining. Some of those concepts that later made it in computer architecture were already in there. Very amazing. It had kind of an instruction fetching and ID and all those kind of things. Pretty cool things. But anyhow, that's nice, but didn't do very much. Then I would say in the early 1900s, people really started doing seriously uh, Boolean logic. Uh, it was still mechanical. Um, actually, in certain areas like, for instance, uh, control of train systems. Um, you think about it, you have a train system. Trains were very popular in the early 1900s. So you have to have a system where you see train comes from the left, in, from the right, there's a couple of lights. You want to make sure that the light is red when a train is on the, on the rail. Or when it's green when the rail is available, or it's orange when you have to go slow. Or when something is blocking the rails. So at that point in time, people start building, using mechanical relays, they start building logic. Like if a train is here and a train is there, then you cannot do that. This type of things. Very simple logic, Boolean function, but purely mechanical. Okay? It was only in the 1930s that people started thinking about actually electronic computing. At that point in time, we didn't have transistors yet. The only thing that was available was vacuum tubes. Um, I guess some of you, who has, ever, who has never seen a vacuum tube? So you're all familiar with vacuum? You haven't seen? Okay. Um, vacuum tubes used to be the amplifiers of, the, of, of any amplifier, the early radios and things like that were all built with basically vacuum tube type devices. Now you could also use vacuum tubes to basically do Boolean logic. And that's really what they did. Um, in, the, um, um, in the late 30s, um, oh, I must have missed, here we go. In the late 30s, early 40s uh, is when we built the first computers, digital computers digital electronic computers, not mechanical, all using basically vacuum tubes, whole racks of them, uh, hundreds of vacuum tubes in a room. Now, if you have ever seen and played around with a vacuum tube, you know also that it's based on basically heat. You have, to, uh, you have a heating element that basically ejects electrons. So you can imagine that it's a big problem. If you have thousands of vacuum tubes in a room, it creates a lot of heat dissipation. Uh, so this required large air-conditioned rooms um, it also was not very, those things tended to be not very reliable because uh, those vacuum tubes tend to break down quite rapidly. So there were some issues with it. But if you look at this picture here, this is the first electronic computer, it was the ENIAC. It was built really, the purpose for this machine was to build, it solved a set of equations, um, basically parabolic equations. There was a good reason for that. Why would you basically think about 1940s? Why would you build a computer? while you want to basically shoot something off and you want to figure out where it ends up, right? Wartime. So these are all ballistic computers, basically, basically computing ballistic tracks of missiles and things like that they wanted to shoot. Uh, so that's why it uh, was the big driver behind the initial versions of those computers. Question? Okay. So that's that. Um, now, vacuum tube computers stayed popular till the mid-60s, yeah. Um, Companies like IBM took on onto this, uh, some other companies, but actually there were some fairly large computational engines built purely based on vacuum tubes. As I said, up to the middle 60s approximately, um, vacuum tubes were the computational element of choice. But then 
1940s happened, late 1940s, 1948, in this place where um, uh, was one place at a point in time, Bell Labs, where, which had a bunch of very brilliant people um, doing quite amazing things. It was really in uh, 1948 that the first transistor was built. And, and this is the picture of the first transistor. You can see it was not something which is very fancy. It was basically, uh, this is a uh, germanium device. And the way they build it is they put layers on top of each other, basically glue them on top of each other. And then to have contact to them, they, what else, how do you basically get your current in and your voltages in? They use paper clips. You can see this is a paper clip based uh, uh, device. The connectors there on the top that you see, nothing else than that. But they could show that they can actually build an amplifier. Something has gained by putting those layers or basically having a dope material um, connect together. Now the next big step was, um, in, as I mentioned, in the late 1950s in a couple of companies. Um, uh, actually, two companies at the same time, Fairchild <coughs> is one. The other one was Texas Instruments, where uh, people say, well, you know, transistors are nice, but it's kind of hard if you have to put paper clips all over the place. Wouldn't it be nice if I can find a methodology of taking a piece of silicon or germanium or whatever it is and be able to build transistors into that material using a set of manufacturable steps? Something that I can repeat over and over again and suddenly something that allows me to put more devices together and do it over and over and over again. Basically, the idea of mass production of transistors. And that's really the integrated circuits. I came around, I said, late 1950s. People who invented it, well, the person uh, from TI that invented it got the Nobel Prize uh, for it. So um, definitely a big step forward. It was really the beginning of the uh, electronic revolution. And here's just shows a little example. This is a bipolar logic gate. Not much, it's a three input NAND gate, or uh, using, was at that point in time, implemented by Motorola. As you can see, not very complex, but it shows you that you can put five, six, seven transistors together and build something that performs interesting logic functions. And then all hell break, broke loose, actually. Uh, uh, the people from Fairchild, Fairchild was a very innovative company. There were, there were a bunch of brilliant people there again. And some of them finally got fed up at Fairchild and started their own comp company. They left the company. It was uh, noise, uh, Bob Moore, and um, a third person. I'm trying to recall the name right now. Andy Grove. Andy Grove. Andy Grove actually, who for a while was a professor here in Berkeley for about a year. Um, but he was one of the key three founders of a company called Intel, uh, about 1969. And about one year later, they came out with two products, which were amazing. Um, changed the world in a big way. The first one was the first microprocessor, shown right here in 1971. It showed that uh, what IBM was building, these giant things, these giant processors, basically by putting individual transistors together, ECL transistors and things like that, very big things, a lot of discrete components. Intel showed that I can put all that function onto a single chip. Now, by today's standards, nothing very impressive, 2,000 transistors, a whopping performance of 740 kilohertz uh, in a 10 micron, think about it, 10 micron. Uh, you could see the transistor with your bare eye, basically. Uh, but it was the fact, that the fact that they could do this was quite amazing. Um, and then they rapidly follow up with new generation. This, by the way, was a 4-bit computer. Um, and any of you ever has tried to build, try and program a 4-bit computer, you know it's not easy. Because you have to break all your computational elements into chunks and you have to combine them together. It's a lot of work. But then came the 8-bit trans uh, microprocessor, there was the 8080, and then there was the 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bits, and the rest is history. So that was one important breakthrough, was the uh, first microprocessor. The same year, Intel also released the first memory. DRAM memory in uh, integrated circuit technology. Again, it was not very much. Four kilobits, or, or one, that was four kilobits memory, uh, which again, today, when we start, today we can do 64 gigabit 
on a single die. Quite a thing, but the fact that they showed that he could integrate a lot of memory to single component was important. Before that, people were using core memory for the basic computer. Core memory is links, basically meta metallic rings, ma magnetic rings with wires through them, and that's the way you program them. Basically, by putting electromagnetic forces, big racks of memory elements. So, another big breakthrough. Now, I so said the rest is history. This is 2005. This is one of uh, the Pentium 4 processor, um, 125 million transistors, 3.8 gigahertz computation, 90 nanometer technologies. And you can see a wide variety of blocks, um, typical for those processes, like here on top, that's all memory, cache memory. So a lot of big parts of those chips now are logic combined with large memory components. And I'll show you some more pictures. It's always fun to look at pictures. Then they said, well, we can do one processor on the chip. Why not do two? Um, so you have two processors here. You take one processor, take another one, and you fill up the rest of your chip with cache memory. Uh, lots of memory on this particular part. Uh, so this is um, 290, 300 million transistors, 3 gigahertz. Today, uh, the state of the art, like the IBM cell processor, you know, those of you have played around with the... Uh, PlayStation 3, uh, probably have experienced that process. That's 10 processes on a chip. And now we're talking, some companies are talking putting 20, 40, 100 processes on a chip. Um, like another example, if you take your, if you have a, one of the latest laptops out there, um, so you take some of this and, uh, Apple Power Books, for instance, in there is a graphics chip by NVIDIA. NVIDIA is basically doing all the graphics processing. If you want to do games, you want to have nice uh, animations, rendering, and all this kind of thing. Uh, a, the, the NVIDIA processor that's in there right now probably has about 80 to 100 computational elements in there, all running in parallel. Massive amount of computation just to give you nice graphic animation on your chip. So major changes over those years. So you might wonder why this is all the case. Why is this been so successful? Why have we gone from just a couple of transistors and why we have been able to sustain that continuous growth to more and more and more devices onto a digital thing? There's a couple of reasons for that, but there's one important one here. Um, so I mentioned the name of uh, Gordon Moore. Um, Gordon, uh, as, uh, at the time, uh, he was still at Fairchild and was involved with his fir first integrated circuit. So he saw that they could do one transistor, they could do two, four. And what he noticed is that they said, well, if you look at the process that we're using to make those chips, and I'll explain a little bit later, next one of the next lecture, we could talk a little bit about the manufacturing process for chips. What he noticed is that there's a process that's inherently parallel, right? I can actually, with the same set of operations, I can print a whole set of transistors in concurrently. And if you keep on changing the feature size, if you make that process more and more precise, you will be able to print more and more transistors on a single die over time. So empirically, he noticed that um, uh, within Fairchild, uh, that the number of transistors they could put on a chip by basically making the process better, improving on the process step, was doubling about every 18 to 24 months. And based on that, he says, well, if you extrapolate from this, we should be able to double the number of transistors on a chip every 18 months. And that's the famous Moore's Law. He wrote a paper about this in 1965, and it's worth reading that paper. Um, it is based purely on a manufacturing argument, <coughs> how those chips are being done. The other amazing thing is, I said, he wrote this paper in 1965. And this, by the way, this is a figure from the original paper. And you can see this is um, not the most scientific paper in the world. This is, well, gee, we had, uh, if you look, this is log. We had one transistor in 1959. We had about uh, three in 1962. We had four in 1963. And we did five in 19. So based on that, you say, okay, I look at it, and there's a straight line in between those things. So we extrapolate it. And we predict that by the year 1975, we will have 65,000 transistors on the chip. 
So that's quite a uh, daring extrapolation, as far as I'm concerned. You have a, just three samples, or four samples, and it's okay, from here on, it's going to go on forever. You should also read the paper uh, that, in the paper he says, after 1975, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, this kind of works to a certain point, but I'm not sure if this is going to extend forever. But it's clear uh, that uh, he was, his was more visionary than he even thought, because this thing has gone forever, and it's still going on today. We're still doing the same thing. Every 24 months, we double the number of transistors on a chip, which is quite amazing. So this is the result of this. Um, this is the number of bits per chip, uh, mostly driven by memory, but also if you look at what's happening with memories, and 1980s, as I said, the first memory was about four kilobits, but then year after year after year, we have been putting more memory bits on a single die. The first 64 gigabit chip was presented about last year, DRAM. Um, now think about it, uh, you, you start, reasoning about the full book. We could do a full book on a chip in the year 1990. Okay? It's no surprise to you anymore. You basically, you take one of those big flash memories and can store 10 to 100 books on a single thing. But then by the year 2000, we could put the complete encyclopedia on a single thing. I'm pretty sure, pretty close now, we're actually we're close to putting actually the whole human memory onto a single die. We're not that far away from it anymore if you would figure out how human memory works. That's a different issue. Okay, so very clear trend, more and more transistors on the device, larger density. Uh, now, the interesting part is, I said, why, you, why is that important? You also have to observe that this is done while not raising the cost, okay? For each of the devices, the cost of your transistor chip has approximately remained the same which means that the cost per transistor is halving every 24 months. It was actually Gordon Moore himself in a presentation about, um, what was it, uh, 45 years ago, Gordon Moore gave a presentation at a big conference. He said, you know, the cost of a transistor is about 0 0.1 a tenth of a micro buck. <laughs> right, uh, you have a micro dollar. It's a tenth of a micro dollar was the cost of a transistor at that point in time. Right now, it's probably something more like a, uh, a nano buck or something like that per transistor. Think about it. Very cheap. Making transistors is basically cheap. We shouldn't worry too much about using transistors here or there. <coughs> so those are memories. Same thing happened for microprocessors. This is a nice picture showing all the transistors. Here's our um, 4004, 4-bit microprocessor. And since then, bingo. Straight line. Almost. Well, it goes a little bit up and down, but overall, this it's amazing how processes have followed that law. Uh, it's uh, it's quite staggering uh, that now with the dual core, we're sitting at a couple of hundred million transistors onto a die. So again, number of transistors on the chip doubles every two years. Okay. Now, what happened with the frequency? So people started. Another thing, when you scale down technology, like we've done, we basically scale down the features, we make the transistor smaller, but another side effect we got from that is that it become faster as well, <coughs> that they switch faster. So some people started to believe that Moore's law said that uh, the performance of a microprocessor would double every 24 months as well. And uh, people at the different companies like Intel and AMD have been working very hard to make that happen. And until recently, this was actually the case. If you look at it again, we have our microprocessor running at about hundreds of kilohertz, through megahertz, and finally at gigahertz. But what you observe is that this is, if you, again, let's put a nice straight line to this. So we saw basically a doubling every two years in frequency ain't happening anymore. If you look at the last couple of generations, we see that slowly but surely, we see a slowdown. Actually, I can predict it's going to take a while before you're going to see a 6 gigahertz or a 10 gigahertz microprocessor. It might even never happen. Now, the question is, you might ask yourself, why? Has something fundamentally changed? 
Uh, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, it is true that if we know, we're getting into scaling regime around so that's 65 nanometers, 45 nanometers, 32 nanometers, and so on and so forth. We get a scaling regime that um, um, we're getting very close to some physical limitations. Um, and you're starting to think about, you know, a molecule is about a couple of nanometers in size. So you start getting transistors which where you can start counting the number of molecules making up the device some physical limits start to get in place, which are capping out how much faster you can go. That's one thing, okay? Um, the scaling of performance is not going up as fast anymore as we had in the past. So that's one reason. But there's another reason. We actually, if you really wanted to, we could easily build a 10 gigahertz processor today. I think it's absolutely doable. There's only one problem you would have to have a cooling tower sitting on top of that, that big, power dissipation. That's really the limiting factor. And I'll show you that here. Next slide. This was the projection of uh, microprocessor power in the year 2000. So, hey, if we keep on scaling frequency as we did in the past, every generation you go faster and faster, suddenly one of our microprocessors by 2008 would take 18 kilowatts. Um, now, I can see over your laptop with 18 kilowatt processor, it will be really, really hot uh, to carry. And it would basically melt away in a very short amount of time. So obviously this is something we could not do. Uh, we we're starting to run in what we call the power limit. And today, for virtually any <coughs> application space, we're talking about laptops, we're talking about mainframe or basically data center type of big processors. We talk about cell phones. All of this area, what you really can do in terms of performance is limited by power, okay? Obviously, we couldn't do this thing. 18 kilowatt microprocessors were ridiculous. So what has happened is, obviously people at Intel are not stupid, um, as they've shown in the past, they started adjusting things. And as a result of that, what we've seen is that uh, they realized that basically keeping on increasing the clock frequency really was basically running smack into a wall. And they backed off from that. So today we're basically seeing processes kind of capping out at 3 gigahertz, something you can easily do. And we're getting performance in a different way. So well, maybe you can get performance not by putting more clock frequency in there, but maybe I can put two processes on a chip and run in parallel. That's why we have dual core. And next, this year, I think 2008, you will see the first quad cores coming out. And next year, probably gonna be, or two years from now, it's gonna be 16 cores on the chip. Now, how you're gonna use them, that's a different question. But the trend is really towards capping out clock frequency and putting more processors in parallel. And this way, we can keep the power dissipation under control. You don't want to have a microprocessor that runs higher than about 100, 100 watt, approximately. Go higher than that, you have a problem. Because you might get problems. So um, you can see the power dissipation. What has happened is exactly this. You see the power dissipation, when frequency goes up, power dissipation of processors has gone up consistently as well. But we see recently it's flattened out. Because 100 watt is really the limit you can put in, let's say, in laptop you have to get rid of the heat. You have to be able to take it out. If you don't do so, you get this thing. One second. Oh, um, let me just go down. A little bit further, I'll come back to that. That's what you get. Uh, if you basically are not careful, and you don't really manage the power very well, the thing just burns away. I'll show you this later. There's um, a very nice place on the web where they show some experiments. What you do with chips, what happens with chips when you take off the heat sink. Most of those microprocessors, you take your computer up, you take your laptop, you unscrew the whole thing and you look at the processor in there, you will see there's some very interesting cooling equipment in there. Making sure you can take the heat away from the microprocessor to the outside, to the fan. You have a fan here that's running. 
So you have to take it out. Very complex type of technology. If it doesn't work, you get this. You really have the chips melting away right in front of your eyes. You see smoke coming out. Actually, the best case I've ever seen was a um, was ever nicest story I've ever heard was um, some people using FPGAs. You're familiar with, with FPGAs. Uh, those of you who have taken CS150 definitely have played around with this field program gate rate. Uh, it was one company had vertical boards stacked up with FPGAs. Those things were running so hot, and they were soldered using solder into the board. They're going so hot they basically unsoldered themselves. So the chips started falling off the board while they were running. <laughs> the stuff in the thing. So, so heat and power dissipation is obviously an important thing to be concerned about. Let me go back here. This is nicely animated. So as I said, basically what we do in microprocessor, typically depending upon the application, if it will be a desktop processor versus a laptop, you're going to have different limits. Okay, in a desktop or something like a, if you go to a Google data center where they have racks of processors, they have more sophisticated cooling equipment. They can cool the whole room. Sometimes they can run liquid cooling through the place. They can afford to have processors running maybe at 300 watts or something like that. But in a laptop, 60 to 100 watt is about the max you basically can sustain. But that's still a big, a huge amount. Now, so another thing that you have to be aware of is uh, that while we're doing this scaling, so we're putting more performance on there, more functionality, power goes up, but the chip size itself doesn't go up that much. Right? Uh, chip sizes are typically now about for a microprocessor, maybe a centimeter half on the side, approximately, centimeter to a centimeter half. So you have a fixed area. You increase the power, what happens is that the amount of power dissipation per unit area goes up. So what's called the power density. And power density will determine how much cooling I have to provide. Because it's clearly maxima that what I can basically sustain. If I don't manage the temperature very well, the, te the chip starts to heat up, it goes to 100 degree, it melts. But it, in interest, some, some interesting numbers here that I would like to point out, just look at this animation here. At around uh, 1995, if you look at this number here, at about 100 watt per square centimeter, is typically the power, the heat temperature, the power density we see in nuclear reactor. We started getting this on, um, uh, we got this around nine, 2003, 2004. If you go any further, you got to start getting, oh, by the way, we got around the hot plate around 1995. That means you take your chip, you don't cool it, you can actually start boiling water on it. Um, which interesting thing, but obviously not the intention. And if you go to 1,000 watt per square centimeter, it's like a rocket nozzle. So obviously not something you would like to have in your electronic circuits. That wouldn't work very well. So again, this ain't happening. People keep it flat. Uh, basically about... 100 watt or 50 watt per square centimeter is something I can live with and something we have to work for. Okay. Oh, yeah, you also have the sand surface. Now, I've been telling you a lot of stories about uh, microprocessors because in the past this used to be the driving forces. But as you all know, uh, there's another thing that has happened over the last 10 years. Suddenly people got interested in mobile devices. First laptops, and now smartphones and all these kind of things. If you look at the latest uh, smartphones you're getting out of there, these are fairly sophisticated devices. It's a lot of processing in there, a lot of memory, flash memory. You can play music with it. You can look at maps. You can do all this type of thing. Just look at the iPhone, for instance. A lot of intelligence there, a lot of processing. Uh, it's an important market. This is driving it. Uh, a lot of the industry these days. Just to think about it, in the year 2007, take a guess how many cell phones got sold in 2007. Any idea? Yes. That's exactly right. Uh, 2007, one billion cell phones got sold. That's a huge number. Think about this, seven billion people on Earth, and you sell a billion cell phones? Huge number. It means that some people walk around with four of them, I guess. Um, Last year, the projection for this year is 1.15 billion cell phones to be sold. Huge numbers, which means that today, actually, um, the number of, if you look at the sales ratio of cell phones over PCs, it's about 1 to 5. It's five times more cell phones sold per PC 
And certain areas, like for instance, countries like India and China, is more like 10 to 1. Actually, the laptop or the, the cell phone starts to replace the computing device. Now, in a laptop, I, it's a nice size factor. I can put some nice big batteries in there. That doesn't work in a cell phone. I have a very small battery. So there, the number you can live with is not 100 watt, but it's 3 watt. That's what you get. That's your power budget. If you want to make it run for a week, we don't have to recharge the whole thing all the time, 3 watt of power dissipation. And you have to do all those fancy image processing. You want to have streaming video coming to those things, all for 3 watt. So you understand now why power optimization is a very important thing. That's why we worry about power dissipation a lot. So design today is now a trade-off between power and performance, power and performance. And that's what we're going to do a lot in this class. We're basically going to think about design. So, okay. um, sometimes you're going to try to be as fast as you can, but sometimes say, no, 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 let's put a max. Sometimes it doesn't matter. It says, well, if I'm fast enough, it's okay. Like, for instance, when I do video, it doesn't make sense for me to run the video faster than I can look at it. Uh, you just want to have a fixed data rate. Once I make me that fixed data rate, the only thing you want to do is either better quality or you want to reduce power. So that's the trade-off games that you play in digital design today. And I think uh, that's what I'm going to keep on hammering on through the semester. We're going to really look at circuits and say, okay, what are the parameters? What are the goals we're going to design for? But it's clear that things are changing. Um, and as I showed you, we have gone from a performance-driven world through a power-limited world. And that's basically impacting a lot of our industry. So I'm going to ra wrap up this overview in next lecture. And then I'm um, going to start talking a little bit about how you measure things like power. How do you measure things like performance? What are those metrics all about? OK? Make sure that uh, your name is filled in in the uh, uh, sign-up sheet. Who has a sign-up sheet? Is it hanging around somewhere? All right, great, thanks. So I'll see you on Friday. Oh. <laughs>